Well, good morning. Rodney, I am sorry. I didn't see you till I already started Lord's Supper. So next time. I didn't see you until I'd already started. And then I said, there he is. So it's all right. That's all right. You look great. You look great. And that was a sweet poem to your wife that you read to all of us. But um, it's good to see you. And you guys are wearing matching red. I didn't think to wear a matching shirt today. We could have called each other like kids in high school. Instead, I spilled coffee all over my shirt this morning on the way here. So the good news is my shirt is caffeinated, so it's wide awake. It's good to see you guys this morning. How many of you have ever, now this is a baby one, how many of you have ever bought a heart-shaped box of chocolate for someone? Actually, last night was really bad because one of my friends did not raise his hand, and I'm like, you have so, and yelled at him, which is not a good way to be loving when you're talking about love. So I'm going to tell you about my worst uh, Valent- I almost said Halloween. <laughs> My worst Valentine's Day ever at Westminster Christian School, by the way. WCS, go Warriors. All right, we have a warrior in the house. So anyway, um, so I was in junior high. I, uh, I, I, you know, the best example I can say is um, Napoleon Dynamite was cooler than I was. Uh, and so, especially in seventh grade. Seventh grade, I, you know, just still... Still working out how to walk, you know, and, uh, and dropping your books and all this stuff. I figure it's because you grow overnight or you're just awkward. So um, we had a skate party uh, uh, near uh, the falls. Remember the skating rink used to be near the falls over there? And so our school had a skating party near the falls. And, of course, they do the, now it's time for the races, everybody. They had a DJ at the thing. And he, he was uh, a frustrated lounge singer, usually. And uh, he's like, hey, uh, today we're going to have a, a uh, race. So let's get out there and race. And then one time, I remember uh, when I went skating, I, uh, they said, we're going to do the fanciest skate competition. And I won a KC and the Sunshine Band record. I know. What's cool is records are cool again, so kids actually know it. There was a time where I would say record, and they'd be like, what is that? And now it's like cool again, so I say record. They're like, oh, cool, they had a record. Uh, anyway, so uh, we're at the thing. You know, the, the kids are there, junior high kids are all there. We're skating, and all of a sudden, the guy comes over the thing. Hey, it's time for an all's couple skate, so go find your girl and ask her to skate. So I went and found Amy, and I said, hey, you want to skate? And she said, okay. So we skated to the most romantic song. It was ACDC. Uh, true. That's absolutely a true story. Because every time I hear that song, my poor wife, every time I hear that song, I'm like, yeah, I remember skating with Amy. And she's like, that's a long time ago. And the rest of the story is not as fun as that part. So Valentine's Day comes. And uh, so I buy a box of chocolate. And this is the day. You know, back in the early 80s, you would ask somebody to go steady. Does anybody remember you want to go steady? How about you want to go with me? Do you remember that? How many of you are too old even for that? Okay, so, um, so, so I took the box of chocolate. And as I walked up to her, a guy named Tim, who was really popular, you probably know a few of his brothers, walked up in between before I got to her with the chocolate and asked her to go steady, to which I just kind of, oh no. So I did the full Napoleon Dynamite. If you haven't seen what Napoleon Dynamite is, I just kind of walked over, pretty much threw a chocolate heart box at her, and walked away. I did not say a word. I did not do anything. Now, let me tell you what's funny about this story. On the way home last night, my mom says, you know, you got to be careful sharing some of those stories because it sounds like you're trying to make yourself sound cool. Just so you know, my mother does not pay attention, apparently, in church. So she's watching this morning and wondering why I'm telling this story again. I walked off. Now, here was the worst part. Later that day, Tim walks into class with a box of chocolates that he's eating. Now, I don't know if you've ever had these moments of rejection in your life that you don't forget. I will tell you this. I got over Amy pretty quickly. Okay? Uh, She was not my foundation for living or my foundation for life. But here's what I know about you. Some of you were rejected by somebody you really cared about, whether it was a parent, a brother, or a sister, maybe somebody you respected, maybe even a teacher who only loved and cared about you when you did what they you they wanted you to. When you behaved, they loved you. And when you misbehaved, whatever their definition that was, suddenly they didn't love you anymore. And here's the danger as we talk about Jesus loves me is this, because everybody says, oh, Jesus loves me. But here's the problem. 
because you grew up with an authority in your life or somebody in your life that made you feel like God loves me when I fill in the blank and he doesn't love me when I fill in the blank. You go through life, you know, like the dog that's afraid of being hit again. Just you, you don't know how when you read verses about love, you're able to nod and look at the pastor and go, yes. Yes, God so loved the world. That means me. I get it. He loves me. And then you really think, but not if he really knew me. But, but not if he noticed what I did or thought yesterday. And let me tell you the awesome part about God. He not only knows every thought that you have, he also knows all your weaknesses and your failings and your doubts, and your questions, and your struggles. And yet the Bible says He still loves you. And today I want to look at three things. And what I want to focus on, number one, is the love of Jesus. Because really, you can't do the three things I'm going to talk about. But I want to give you three very practical things this week to help you love somebody else. Because here's what I know. Even if you are still working out this whole, Jesus loves me. Remember the kid's song, Jesus loves me, this I know. We sang it. Even though you may still be working on that because of some rejection, some hurt, some way of you thinking about God because somebody read the Bible to you the wrong way. You didn't see the whole of Scripture. You just saw a little piece and you said, oh, he hates my guts. It, it, today, I hope you'll know, first of all, that he loves you. And even if you're working on that, there'll be some practical ways that you can show his love to other people. Do you really know you're loved by God? Today we're going to look at this whole idea. We're going to look at three keys to loving like Jesus. And I'm going to get to Matthew chapter 7. I was going to make Matthew chapter 7 my primary text and do it at all three points. But I decided to do something a little different on point one on purpose. Number one, sacrifice for others. Sacrifice for others. Listen to what it says here. Romans 5, 6 through 8. You see... At just the right time when we were still powerless. This word for powerless in the Greek is a really cool word. It basically means to be sick. Have you ever gotten so sick you can't do anything? Okay. I remember I probably had Norwalk virus looking back. I, I don't know what virus it was, but I was so sick. I was a, a, a young teenager and I was so sick that I could not get out of bed. My sister had her 60th birthday party. 16th, not 60th. 16th birthday party. She had a band. My parents hired a band. I was upstairs above the band. I love bands and I did not move. To the point that my dad came up and rubbed my back. And I remember as a young teenager thinking, oh no, I'm going to die. That's how little my dad hugged me or touched me. I, he either touched me to hurt me usually, uh, uh, to straighten me out, or maybe to pat me on the back. But he came in and he actually rubbed my... It's the only time in my life I can remember my dad rubbing my back. And my instant thought was, I'm going to die. He's come to say goodbye. Here's what it says. At just the right time, when we were so sick, we couldn't do anything. So sinful. So stuck in our sin. So, so in our habits. So in our problems. At just the right time, when we were still powerless, what did God do? He sent Jesus and Christ died for the ungodly. And then it says this. I love this. It's almost like a little tongue in cheek. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Like, you know, like we're like, yeah, I guess they're worth it. I, that's kind of what I feel like. It's like, yeah, maybe for them. But not for them, but for them. But it goes on. Though for a good person, somebody might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates. He shows. He, he gives us a picture. His love for us in this. While we were still sinners. While we were still running from him. While we were still yelling at him. While we were still being godless. Still sinners. Christ died for us. Why? Let me show you why. I've got to borrow it again. i got to go get it. So... So this is Ernie's uh, guitar case. Now, let me tell you what happens to guitarists. They buy an expensive guitar case to protect their super expensive guitar. But what happens over time is the case actually becomes important to them too. So he wouldn't want me to do like a... You ever, by the way, have you ever looked out the plane window to see them handling your luggage? They don't think your luggage is as precious as you do. Did you know that? And so it's the same thing with a case. You know, even if you're careful, a guitar can get bent or hurt. 
Um, I'll never forget, one of my kids borrowed my guitar and left it in their car. Now, you may not think that's bad, but you let heat get to a guitar, it will ruin it. We had a conversation. The reason you buy a case and protect a, car, a, a guitar is because a guitar is precious. We had somebody come to church with a, a newborn baby recently. <laughs> and it was all I could do to, to they were, the baby was, was doing this. And it was all I could do to not just go, just move your hand up, just, to, just right behind the head. Just the, I felt like the baby's head was just going to roll off, you know. And I'm like, do you, do you realize that's precious cargo? Hold that, hold that little giant a uh, uh, football size head on that on that little baby with the giant noggin. It's precious to you. What's precious to you? What's something that you wouldn't want to have touched? Because here's the thing I'll tell you about you. Some of you, there's people that you love and care about. But you can't love them very well. And you don't treat them as precious. And the reason why is because you don't see yourself as precious. You've become the baggage handler at the airport to yourself. You look in the mirror and yell at you. You tell you how, how worthless and how junky you are and all the mistakes you've made. And in the middle of the night, you have a great theater. The, the theater of regret. You ever go to that movie theater at night? It's, it's great. You go to lay down, you close your eyes. As soon as you close them, it goes, remember that Valentine's Day? No. Yes, we're going to visit again. What could you have done differently that day? The best part was when I got home, my sister said, you mean you didn't know she liked you before you gave her the candy? Oh, oh, oh. Listen to this, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Follow God's example, therefore, now listen to this, listen, as dearly loved, he holds your neck, right? Dearly loved children and... Walk in the way of love. Walk this way. Talk this way. Walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up. Now listen, listen. As a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I used to love. And I didn't do it today because some of you are allergic to stuff. But I used to in my science class when I taught uh, middle school science. At some point I would teach about diffusion. And so what you would do is you would spray a little cologne or a little perfume in the air. And, and you go like that. Psh, and you tell the kids, raise their hands. And there was always some doof in the back that would raise their hand right away. And you're like, you're put your hand down. Right? And then what would happen? That perfume or that cologne would go through the class and they would slowly raise their hand. What? They started to smell it. It spread out. Listen. When you do what Jesus did. Jesus came and it was such a sweet offering that when you start to experience God's love, it is an offering. It's a... Man that's, man, that's good. When you really start to get a hold of how much God loves you and recognize that, wow. Something about smells makes you feel better sometimes, right? And if you're a believer, when you do something for somebody else sacrificially, they smell something they've never smelled. <laughs> they, they, they see something they've never seen. They say, hey, where's that fragrance? Is that... That's something. I mean, most of the fragrances I get in light aren't so good. But you actually love me. Let me show you just a few things about sacrificing for others. Unloving habits. We only love the powerful. I always think of a, of a car salesman when I think of loving people for what they give you. And I don't mean to, I know there's some probably wonderful car salesmen in the world, but a lot of them are like, hey, how's it going today? It's good to have you here. Come on in. I got a car for you. Hey, let me go talk to my boss. Oh, I'm sorry. You want a deal? Let me go talk to my boss again. Oh, let me, you want a deal? And I think they go in there and drink coffee and then come back and tell you, you can do it or you can't do it. And they just keep you there for three hours. They try to wear you down, right? And then you say, well, no, I'm not going to get a car here. And they get mad and you realize they only cared about me for what I could do for them. Do we only love the powerful? Watch out for people who only want to hang around people that have power and control and strength. I had to learn that as a pastor. There were people who wanted to be my friend because they thought I had power. And then they got to know me and were like, oh, never mind, right? And be aware that you don't do that. We reject God's love. We walk in selfishness and we can hoard for ourselves, never giving anything away. By the way, you'll never be happy hanging on to your stuff. Now, here's some loving habits. Love the powerless. When's the last time you really went out of your way to sacrifice for somebody who needed 
you. And then receiving God's love, learning how to receive it. Why? Because if you realize how precious you are, it's easier to recognize how precious somebody else is. And if you don't think you're precious, it's very hard to treat anyone else like they matter when you've never looked in the mirror and been able to do that. Walking in love and then sacrificing for others. Now, here's the first challenge I want to give to you this week. You ready? This is, a, this is an easy and yet hard one because we have too many devices. Here it is. I want you this week at some point, maybe it's at work, maybe it's at a restaurant, maybe it's the waiter or waitress. I want you to, you ready? This is a sacrifice. I want you to look somebody in the eyes and talk to them. Don't look down at your phone. Don't look around for the next thing you got to do. Just look and, look and listen to them. Now, don't make it weird. <laughs> but we walk in distraction so often, it's a sacrifice for us even to do that. And hey, hey, if you've got somebody that you struggle sometimes in relationship with, like they start talking and you immediately are like, oh, this week, you know what the sacrifice can be? I'm not going to, even in my mind, I'm not going to roll my eyes. I'm going to listen to what they're saying, listen to what they're meaning. Number two, examine ourselves first. Here's what I know. Unforgiveness will, not might, will destroy you. Unforgiveness is, is when you take your guitar out of the case and start throwing it around. But Eric, that other person hurt me. Don't mix up unforgiveness and trust. Christians all the time, that's the big thing I have to talk to them about. Listen, you can love and forgive somebody. You don't have to like them. You don't have to say what they did was good. You don't have to downplay what they did. Well, it wasn't a big deal. I'm sure they just had a tough childhood. No, you can say that was an awful, terrible thing. You can still forgive them and, ready, ready? You don't have to hang around them. You don't have to allow them to continue to hurt you. Forgiveness does not mean I go to the car dealer, they rip me off, and I say, well, I'm going to go back because I've forgiven them. That's called stupidity. <laughs> Matthew 7, 1 through 5. And I'm going to show you the balance because everybody, people always use this verse and say to me, if I say, hey, God has standards, they say, well, yeah, but he says not to judge. Everybody has standards. Did you know that? Everybody has standards, just a matter of where you get them from. If I come and steal your pencil, there's nobody who says, that's great. So everybody has standards. So what does this verse mean? Listen to this. Do not judge. And the word judge here means condemn. So it means to look at somebody and pronounce judgment on them. You ever meet somebody and you instantly are like, what is wrong with them? You ever come to church and look at the pastor and go, what is wrong? Right? Okay. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Listen. If you... See others as junk. Without knowing it, you'll begin to see yourself as junk. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged with the measure you used. It'll be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? Now, Jesus could have stopped there and said, just don't even look. But he continues. How can you say, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? And then Jesus uses a word that was never used in this context until Jesus used it. He says, you hypocrite, which meant a Greek actor. It was somebody who wore a mask. He's, he talked about the religious leaders being fakers. He says, you faker. And then he says this, first, take the plank out of your own eye, then... You will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And here's what I know. Until you recognize your failures and your failings and your weaknesses, you cannot help somebody overcome theirs. Now, Jesus isn't saying don't help people. Jesus isn't saying that your alcoholic friend, you shouldn't tell them you need to quit drinking. There's, there's a place and time to say to your friend, hey, you drink a little too much. You drink way too, you is ruining your life. Okay, that's love sometimes. But it doesn't mean you do it in an arrogant way. I don't do what you do. You're an idiot. I'm smart. By the way, we usually do that because we feel bad about ourselves, not the opposite. 
How do I know that there's standards? Well, let me point you over to 1 Corinthians 5. The next time, if you want to mess with somebody, the next time somebody says, don't judge, point them to 1 Corinthians, and they'll be like, well, I do huh? Here's what it says. What business of mine is it to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? He says, you need to judge the people inside the church. Whoa, you mean we're supposed to be judgmental? Not the way you think. God will judge those ex- outside. And then it says, expel the wicked person among you. Listen, if we had somebody come into our church and they started swinging on everybody here, just walking around swinging, I wouldn't say, turn the other cheek. I would tackle whoever that is, and we would call the authorities, correct? And they would escort the person to a nice place where they could get some mental counseling. Because something's wrong with that person. But it doesn't mean we don't have standards. It doesn't mean that we can't say there's right and wrong. And this is where people have taken that verse so out of context that they say, I can do whatever I want, and you can't say anything, because the Bible says not to judge. And that's why Paul later had to kind of say, listen... I, I, we're not supposed to judge and condemn each other, but there's a place to say, that's not good. And sometimes the most loving thing you can do is to help somebody who's hurting to recognize that you're broken, but to also say to them, hey, you, you can't come to my house if you're going to act like that. I, I can't hang around you if you're going to get drunk every time we go to dinner. Hey, I can't give you money if you're going to continue to use drugs. You are ruining not just your life, but everybody around you. And the most loving thing you can do sometimes is to know when to hold them. When to walk away. And when to run. Here's some unloving habits. Condemning others. See, judgment is not condemning. You've got to find the balance. Our world doesn't understand that. They think if you tell somebody something's wrong, then you've judged them harshly. No, you don't necessarily condemn somebody. If somebody comes to me and they say, Eric, I need to lose weight. I don't look at them and go, boy, you really do. You know what I say to them? Me too. Number two, no self-examination. We don't look at ourselves. Hey, before you go and tell somebody what their problem is, make sure you've evaluated what your problem is. We're all broken. We're all messed up. And if you don't realize where you're broken and messed up, just take some time to do that. And by the way, if you're married, your spouse can share with you where you're messed up. You need them to. That's what Valentine's Day is all about. (laughs) Pointing out faults. You don't need to be walking around thinking you're the white blood cell of the church either. Well, you got to straighten that out. Yeah. Oh, you got to. Man, you should be like me. You really. Yeah. Right? Because we're all messed up. And then finally, no standards. No standards is also bad. Because if you really have no standards, if you really have no standards, it means you don't even... You don't even worry about what you wear when you go outside. Now, I've been to Walmart, and I think some people have forgotten. But, but even those people have some... Walmart has standards. Did you know that? You go and take some groceries, throw them in a cart, and try to walk out and see what happens. By the way, self-checkout, they're checking you. Don't worry. Number three, number two, loving habits. God's grace to others. Self-examination, helping others, and healthy boundaries. Listen, when you, if you're going to say to somebody, hey, I notice you're struggling in this area, it should never be to try to show them you're better than them. Whenever you have to point out a, a speck in your brother's eye, it should always be about, hey, I, I, I really am here to help you. And by the way, there's times that you shouldn't say anything. Love covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> So you get around anybody long enough and you're going to be like, oh no. You come to my small group, come the first week, oh pastor, such a great Christian. You're there three weeks in, you're like, who let him pastor at this church? So here's what I want you to do. This is challenge number two this week. Take time to evaluate yourself. Where's your biggest struggle? Is it pride? Is it selfishness? Is it self-centeredness? Is it stinginess? Is it caring more about me than anybody else? What, what's the thing that you really struggle with? Hey, maybe it's that you don't know that you're loved by God, so you treat everybody else that way. Just be honest. Maybe you're a gossip. You got, God, I need help in this area. Just be honest about that. That's your second challenge. Number three, give others what they need. Can I tell you what people need most? They don't know it. They need relationships. Did you hear me? Now, not everybody's going to let you have relationships with them, and that's okay. But anytime you can go out of your way to build relationships, do it. 
That means spend time with people. I know in COVID, we've, we've gotten away from spending time with people. But hey, hey, it's time to start to turn down the volume of COVID and turn up the volume of fellowship. My, a lot of so many Bible verses, you can't love people unless you know them, unless you talk to them. And you can't really love people until you find out they're messed up. If you haven't gotten close enough to somebody to realize, oh, no. Then you're not close enough. You've got to at least have a few people in your life that they know your faults and you know theirs. That's relationship. That's what people need the most. And it's practical needs. It's practically knowing people. In Matthew 7, it says this. If you then or who are evil know how to give gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give those Give gifts, good gifts to those who ask him. What's the gift that God gave it to us? Jesus. When you recognize what you have been given, it makes it so much easier to love other people because you don't have a lack. It's hard to feed somebody else when you're hungry. And it's hard to love somebody else when you're love starved. And the first step to getting over love starvation is to recognize how much God loves you. If you don't have a valentine, he is. I know that sounds sappy and weird, but the truth is he absolutely loves you. And can I tell you something else? There are other people who love and care about you. And you may think, well, I got to have this significant other. Let me tell you, there's many significant other people. And some of the people in here that are married and been married for years, there are friends who might actually love you better <laughs> and care more about you than your spouse let God show you his love even through them. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophet. So there's people you shouldn't help. What? That's just mean. No, you know it. You know there's times that, that you've got to have tough love. You've got to give people boundaries. You've got to say, no, we're going to do a boundary series here in a few weeks. And, and so you, there's times that the most loving thing you can do is, I'm not going to give you money. No, I'm not going to take care of that need because you need to learn to stand on your own feet. I mean, when you have a baby, there comes a point where you hold their hands to help them walk. But then there comes a point where you let go of their hands. And if you always hold their hands, guess what? They'll never learn how to walk. Some of you think you're being loving when actually what you're doing is enable, enabling somebody else to not walk on their own. What do they need I want to give you a very practical way that you can give somebody what they need. Because remember I said it's about relationships. Write a note to somebody this week. If you're older and you've never texted, but you have a phone that can text, can I encourage you to text one of your grandchildren or one of your nephews and nieces? And I mean, you can even if you have the old phone where you have to push it three times. To H. I. Send. If they charge you a quarter, you can still do it. Remember that? Maybe you actually pick up that app on your phone called a phone. And you call somebody. Hey, I was just checking on you. I hadn't seen you lately. You doing okay? Go out of your way this week. Remember, I already told you. Look someone in the eyes and listen to them. Take time to evaluate yourself. And then write that note this week. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ because you don't realize how much he loves you. You can do that today. I'll be here after the service. Jesus died on a cross for you and for me. And he loves you. And I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian, but the truth is, hey, you don't think you're precious. If you need to, you put on the mirror, I am precious in God's sight. <laughs> Jesus loves the little children, and I'm one of those. Take some time this week to do that. Why? So you can love other people well. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength. I thank you that you loved us first. Before we could do anything right, before we could get our act down, before we could do anything to try to please you, you loved us. May we walk in that love today. Father, I pray for that one who's hurting today, who's struggling right now because they don't feel loved. As Valentine's Day comes, all they can think is how lonely they are. Father, I pray, number one, that you would pour your love into them. But Father, also, that they would not only recognize, but know that there's people who want to be in relationship with them. May we love each other the way you loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.